Hi, welcome to the Quipster Film Review Podcast. My name is Vince Leo. I am the author of the film review website, Quipster.net. You can find all of my written work at Quipster.net, Q-W-I-P-S-T-E-R.net. Today I'm going to be looking at The Purge Election Year. It's an action, thriller, horror, sci-fi premise. I I probably would put it in the thriller category, or thriller slash action, even though it is pretty much marketed as a horror film. It's an R-rated movie for disturbing, bloody violence and strong language, and it runs an hour and 45 minutes. Frank Grillo returns after his appearance in the second film, along with Elizabeth Mitchell, Michael T. Williamson, Joseph Julia Soria, Betty Gabriel, Terry Serpico, Edwin Hodge, and Kyle Secor. The director and screenwriter is James DeMonico. Now, The Purge election year has themes that tap into today's headlines, pretty much literally if you've been following the news here on the 4th of July week. You know, that makes this seem a lot less like a sci-fi premise with a horror movie sense of aesthetic and more like a freaky funhouse mirror. I don't know if I should put the word fun in there, but it is like a funhouse mirror on our own society in the United States today. It is the third film in the Purge series. It's a direct sequel, I guess, to the second film, The Purge Anarchy, because it continues to follow the main protagonist of that film, Leo Barnes, played by Frank Grillo, and it's a continuation of the lifting of that escape from New York plot line that the previous film had been exploiting. And just like Escape from New York, this one puts a politician to try to save at the heart of it with a Snake Plissken-like character in Leo Barnes. He doesn't have an eye patch, but pretty much a badass in that way. Whereas the first two films had more personal stakes during the Night of a Million Horrors, This entry does open the scope wider so that the ramifications of The Purge does have national, perhaps even international, I guess, consequences because there is a presidential election at stake. The Purge of the title, for those who are still unaware, if my podcast is the first time you're hearing of this series, I guess I'll explain that The Purge is an annual celebration in which for a 12-hour period, any crime that you can think of is declared legal during that period. The police, the firefighters, medical services, they all take a break. United States citizens run amok without fear of prosecution for any of the misdeeds that they commit. The Patriotic Day, or I guess I should say so-called Patriotic Day, now faces the biggest challenge since its inception because there's an independent party senator named Charlene Rowan, also known as Charlie in the film. She's a woman whose family was killed right in front of her eyes on Purge Night 18 years prior. She's now running in a hotly contested battle for the presidency with a platform based on abolishing the purge practice because she says it's being used by the wealthy elite in business and government as a means to eradicate poor and sick people because they feel they're an economic burden on the rest of society. Senator Rowan's opposition for the seat is a representative of the status quo. He has the backing of the NFFA, which are the new founding fathers of America who basically created the purge. These are a group of, I guess they're mega Christian right wing elites. They're older, they're white, they're rich. You can read into that, even though it doesn't expressly use any phrases about ultra white wing or elite or tea party or anything like that. Make of it what you will. The NFFA is desperately needing to thwart the senator's momentum because if she wins, they're going to lose their stranglehold on the direction of American society to their favor. They market this change in the law to be more, I guess, fair and balanced. Read into that what you will. They changed the Purge Night Law that initially had protected government officials from harm during the evening. And they want to make things right to those people who feel that they're targeting the downtrodden. So now no one is safe because those politicians, those government officials are now just as much of a target as anyone else. However, really, this is all a ruse to get to Senator Rowan. She's decided that she has to hide in her home and not in some big armed bunker because it won't look good to the people who are voting for her if she has special privileges. So she's going to try to stake it out for the night in her house, just like everybody else out there. You know, she does have armed guards with her, but outside of that, she's pretty vulnerable. There are a lot of big guns who are out to get her, and it's up to her chief of security, Agent Leo Barnes, 
as well as later a kind and resourceful store owner named Joe and a few cohorts of his, they all believe in the senator and what she stands for, and they are out to protect a vulnerable senator from being killed, along with the plight of the nation's victimized poor, through the acts of this purge. Unfortunately, there's nowhere to hide when just about everyone out in the Washington, D.C. streets is out and about to bask in the blood of the weak. So the Purge series has thus far been the brainchild of writer-director James DeMonico. He has written and directed all three films in the series. Each one of them broadens the ideas built from the previous entry. This one is more interesting in terms of the little tidbits about the Purge that it brings out. One thing it introduces are these murder tourists, which are foreigners who are traveling to America for the holiday in order to revel in the slaughter themselves. And there's this notion of how insurance companies are using this opportunity to further bilk the poor. They jack up the rates of insurance just before purge night, and that results in those on the lower end of the economic spectrum going completely out of business, or if not that, they end up having to put their own lives on the line to fend for their establishments themselves. There's also this notion that is put into play here in this film that violence is all-encompassing when everyone commits to it as a means to an end, and that there, there is a sense of hollowness to the act of murder. It causes more problems than it could ever fix, and it only breeds more of it in retribution. So there's this real fight among those people who are trying to fight the NFFA as to how to go about it. Is Are they going to do it through peaceful means, through the law, or are they going to fight back through a revolution? So there are the main conflicts of the series. DeMonico is also fleshing out some new characters for us to follow, with the exception of the Frank Grillo, Leo Barnes character. Each one of the characters, they don't get a lot of screen time, but they bring something more to the story than being merely fodder for slaughter. You know, most horror movies, and I, like I said, I hesitate to call this a horror movie anyway, despite its marketing, is that, you know, you introduce a lot of new characters and you watch them get picked off one by one, this one is a little bit different than that because these characters are heroes, essentially, that we come to root for. Uh, some of them may live, some of them may die, but inevitably they're not just here to be the next victim. We come to like all of these supporting characters, and so we feel some investment in whether they will all survive for the night. That makes for some pretty tense moments at just the right intervals to make the purge election year's sense of dread Somewhat palpable as the climax nears. There are some missed beats here and there. You know, this is not a perfect movie. I think there's an excessive use of the action genre, crowd-pleasing, last-minute savior contrivance. There's this epilogue that feels very flaccid to all of the bombastic elements that came before. And I, I won't spoil it, but it features a news report that should have some real excitement and real interest, but... I guess realism and plausibility are just too much to expect from a knowing B-movie franchise. Perhaps the more plausibility you introduce into this film, the more questions it's going to ultimately raise. I guess, thankfully, the film does rarely stop enough in its action for us to ponder all of these multitudinous leaps in logic that are required for the entire premise to hold some semblance of a plot. As with the other films in the series, The Purge Election Year is as I mentioned, marketed as a horror film. There are a few modest jump scares here and there, and there are some horrific blood-drenched moments that are perpetrated by some murderous thugs who are wearing scary masks. One character compares Purge Night to Halloween for adults. You know, this is not a movie that has supernatural malevolence at play, as you would find in most horror movies. And unlike other slasher movies, it's not overtly gory or graphic. In fact, it turns away from a lot of the stuff that would have been very graphic in a traditional slasher film. So only really the aesthetic and the use of music, perhaps, and just the way that it's marketed in the media is really what kind of keeps its foot in the door of horror. But I don't know that I would necessarily recommend it to just horror fans. As far as shying away from some really heinous acts, you know, murder is a, a reprehensible act in and of itself. But there are more horrific crimes that could have been committed during Persian Night that were not shown. I assume they exist, but that's not the main thrust of this movie. Sexual assaults, certainly on women or things happening to young children, those are generally completely ignored on Purge Night as envisioned by 
DeMarco in these films. So I guess we can be thankful for that. DeMonico seems to be leaning more toward a social satire in depicting this side of American society and wants to explore how the haves are perpetually using their wealth and their influence to effectively punish the have-nots because those people don't have, they need help. And these rich elite people see themselves as the victims who have to shoulder the load of a society that they don't feel are worthy of their so-called hard-earned work to gain wealth. So in, in this way, it's a very repugnant, very ultra-violent kind of movie. But I guess that's because it's trying to paint our society as somewhat repugnant and ultra-violent too. The film is likely targeting, in terms of its genre exercise, those who do like bloody thrillers. But I do think that the underlying dark and potent allegory commentary on race and class in America, even if it's broad stroke in its delivery, it does make it palatable for visceral-minded viewers who are not merely salivating for the sight of on-screen glory kills. So... While it's not for everybody, certainly it doesn't hold a lot of water as a satire if you really want to think about it. But for, you know, an hour and 45 minute B-movie excursion within a franchise that really should have had no business extending beyond the first film, it's actually not bad. So I'm going to give it three stars out of four for the Purge election year. Three stars on my scale means that I recommend it with reservation strictly for genre enthusiasts and not very many people beyond that. So if you like at least the second Purge, I was not a fan of the first Purge. I thought the second one was a step up, even though it was different and it did seem more like that John Carpenter kind of movie. This movie continues that vibe as well. So I think if you like the second movie, you have a higher chance of liking this third movie. If you thought the first movie was the best and not the second you know, this is not going in the direction you want. You're probably not going to like this as much either. So if you like The Purge Anarchy, give election year a chance. Thanks, everyone, for listening. I hope that you enjoyed this review. If you do, I, I do encourage you to click the subscribe button, and you will continue to get all of my reviews downloaded into your podcast player. As I mentioned in my previous episode, I am seeking your help. Uh, there has been a change in the way that I am able to see movies and it's going to cost me a lot more out of pocket to do so starting at the end of this month. So either I have to reduce the amount of movies that I do get to review, or if people enjoy me covering a lot of the smaller films, independent movies, some foreign movies, in addition to these big blockbusters, I do encourage you to lend a hand. And you can go to patreon.com slash quipster to find out how you can help. Even if it's just $1 a month for 20 episodes downloaded into your podcast player, that is an immense help to this show. Because all of it is coming out of my pocket from the podcast hosting platform to all of the tickets that I buy and all of these reviews at no cost to you. So if you're somebody who enjoys the show, I encourage you to do that. Patreon.com slash quipster patreon spelled p-a-t-r-e-o-n quipster spelled q-w-i-p-s-t-e-r thanks everyone for listening until next time i hope that you enjoy your time anytime you get to go to the movies 